Purpose, the reason for which something exists. Each one of our purposes were created long before anyone walked the earth. All of us hold it, yet sometimes we spend our whole lives searching for it. Our purpose is to glorify God in our mission, our relationships, and our legacy in Christ. Even in the midst of change, times of uncertainty, in times of joy. This is what it means to live life on purpose. Well, good morning, church. Man, it is so good to be together. I tell you, I've been looking forward to this day. Let's just, yeah, come on. I, uh, I'm just so grateful. I tell you, it has been three months, uh, but God has been at work in the middle of the three months and moving and doing great things and ministry-wise and moving in a mighty way, but I just missed being here. I got to tell you, I missed being with you guys. It's so good just to see faces. It does my heart good. And, and for you joining online, welcome to you guys. Just love being a part of the church all together. Uh, you know, these last three months, I mean, it's kind of been surreal, right? I mean, everything that's happened and a lot that's been going on, it's like, well, the economy shut down and school stopped and everything else. And you're just going, what, what happened here? But so I just want to say to you, if you celebrated a birthday during those three months, happy birthday. You know, so you didn't have to get to have a party or anything, but happy birthday to you. If you graduated, happy graduation to high school, college. If you got married or something, hey, congratulations to you too. And lots of things happened during that time. And I just want you to know this, that I pray during this time that God protected us, but that God also grew us. And maybe that somehow, some way, God slowed us down a little bit and God showed us the things that are really important and revealed to us his heart that God is with us, that God is for us, and that God has sent his son Jesus, that we have eternal life, that this life is not all that there is, that there is more to come, that God has surrounded us with people, with family, with friends, with church, with community, that we're there for one another. And in this time that we start to realize the things that really matter in life and the joy that we have, the grace that God has given to every one of us, and I know for many that it's been a, some good times in the middle of this and parents being home, dads being home and having some rich times of games and walks and those kind of things. But I also know there's been tough times as well. And I want you to know if you've been going through a tough time, just that you're not alone, right? And God is with you. God is for you. Maybe there's been a passing of a loved one. You couldn't be there and how hard that is. And we recognize our need for God and we recognize our need for each other. And so, hey, I'm just glad we're back together. And I'm praising Jesus today. I'm praising Jesus that he is with us, that he is for us. I'm praising him for our health because a lot of times we take that for granted and just say, thank you, God, that you protect us, that you hold us up, that you are our strength, you are our grace. We need it. I'm just praising God for family and for friends. And I'm thanking God for you, church, and all that you mean to me, all you mean to one another, that we are the body of Christ. And we're the body of Christ together. Hey, God is at work. And today we're launching into a brand new series called Life on Purpose. And I got to tell you, I'm really excited about this series because I believe so many people in life, we just get caught up in the busyness, don't we? We get caught up in the distractions and our our life is headed this way and and we don't ever really kind of stop and say, am I living out my purpose? Am I accomplishing what God put me on this earth to accomplish? You know, or am I just going along with the flow? Am I just caught up in career or money or things or stuff? Or, or if I really evaluate, man, my life has a purpose and my life has a meaning. And God wants to accomplish something great through me. The saddest thing I think is for people to get to the end of their lives and look back and have regret. You know, at the end of their lives, and they go, oh, I missed it. I missed it. I lived for the wrong things. And you can't do anything about it then. Guys, we get one shot. We get one opportunity. Let's live it all for the glory of God. You know, let's live it all so we get to the end of our life, we don't have any regrets. We go, I wasn't perfect, I made mistakes, I messed up, but hey, praise be to God, I lived out the purpose he had for me. Praise be to God that I live my life for the glory of God. That's what I want for every one of us. And so in this series, we're gonna be walking through this summer, we're gonna see a guy who got it. We're going to see a guy who was living for the world, living for his things, living for money, living for stuff, even for religion, but he missed Jesus. And today we're going to see how Jesus encountered him and changed his life forever. And I pray that God will do that for us as well. So if you have a Bible with you today, hey, open with me to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, or maybe you've got a mobile device. You can access the scriptures at YouVersion. If you're watching online, grab an iPad or go to the Rolling Hills app and you can get the scriptures right there. Acts 
chapter 9. Now, Acts, you may remember this, right? We just finished this great series, We the Church. But Acts was written by a guy named Luke. And Luke, who was a doctor, a physician, very knowledgeable, very wise, very detail-oriented, and he wrote volume 1. And volume 1 is the gospel of Luke. So he wrote the gospel of Luke all talking about Jesus. Jesus' birth, you got the whole birth narrative there. You got Jesus' healing ministry, his teaching ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Praise be to God. And then you come to Acts, which is volume two, right? And this is the early church. This is what God did, the way God moved, what God wants to do throughout the world. And so we see Acts 1, where Jesus, after his resurrection, meets with his disciples. And he tells them, guys, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And so here's this group of believers, right? 120 believers in Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes, and Peter stands up at Pentecost, and 3,000 people accept Christ. And man, the church is just on fire. I mean, God is moving in a mighty way in Acts 3 and Acts 4. 5,000 men, part of the church. And there's women and children. I mean, this thing is growing In Acts chapter 6 and then Acts chapter 7, persecution comes, right? The Jews are not happy now. Judaism, they're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. This church thing over here is getting out of control. You know, they're saying Jesus is the Messiah. He's already come. We don't believe that. And so all of a sudden this conflict comes, and there's a guy, Stephen. We left off in our last series in Acts chapter 7 that Stephen was taken out of the church, right? And he's taken before the Sanhedrin, and then he is stoned to death. And if you remember, there was a guy there named Saul. And it's kind of this short reference, but it says that everybody who's stoning Stephen, they take their coats and they lay it at the feet of this guy, Saul. And Saul's there giving approval to it all. And here's a guy, Saul, who was a religious leader. I mean, he was wealthy, he was successful. He's probably about 28 to 30 you know, at this age. And he is just on this career track. And he starts this mission to persecute the church. But here's the thing about God, right? When things are hard or they're tough or they're difficult, many times it's when God does his greatest work. And in the midst of the persecution, what happened is all these believers there at the church in Jerusalem, they started going out and staying with their family, friends, and extended family, you know, in other cities. And when they went, they started telling people about Jesus. They're going, God, you wouldn't believe it. Jesus, he's resurrected, he's the Messiah. And then their families started coming to know Christ. And so churches are starting in these different areas in these different cities. And it's just springing up all over the Roman Empire. The gospel is going out. Just like Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And so this guy Saul, he has this mission to stop the church. But in the process, God gets a hold of him. In the process, God changes his heart and his life. In the process, God changes the purpose of Saul's life, just like God wants to do for each of us. So pick up here, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Okay, this guy is angry, right? I mean, he is upset. He is mad. And he's taken on the church, right? He's taken on people who are followers of Jesus Christ. And so he goes and he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, men or women, I mean, this guy's like on a mission, right? Men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So Damascus is about 150 miles north of Jerusalem. Okay, so if you go to Israel, and I hope every one of you gets the chance to go, we do a biblical study tour every couple of years over to Israel. It's amazing. It's incredible. Uh, But I've stood on the Golan Heights and looked down this place toward Damascus. And that's a road that Saul would have been traveling on. Uh, We're going to post something on social media. You can kind of get the terrain and see that this week. But he's going with this entourage. He's got soldiers. They're going to arrest men and women, right? who were followers, and now did you notice this? Who would belong to the way. Way is capitalized. You know the early church was called the way? I tell you, I kind of like that. You know why? Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through me. So they said, hey, we're part of the way. 
right? Jesus is the way to eternal life. Jesus is the way to God. Jesus is the way to peace. Jesus is the way to hope. They were called the way. And so here's Saul on this mission to take out the church. He's going there, and as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Notice Jesus calls his name. Saul, Saul. Do you know that Jesus knows your name? Oh, yeah. He knows your name. There's points in your life, I believe that's still a small voice. He just says your name. Hold on. Hold on. I got you. I'm with you. Saul, Saul, what are you doing? Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, when Jesus said this, I believe Saul was like, whoa, wait a minute. Because Saul was alive when Jesus was crucified. Saul heard the rumors that Jesus was resurrected. Saul saw the church growing like crazy, and he's like, Jesus, he's alive. He is here. He appeared to him right there. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. Well, of course. I mean, like, you know, this bright light, everybody's on the ground, right? This voice. I mean, you're just like, what is going on? They heard. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. And look at verse 9. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Three days. Three days, I believe, three days for Saul to examine his life. Three days to say, you know what, my life was all about this. I was successful, a lawyer, I'm making money, right? But there is this anger and this bitterness in me and this rage in me. Three days. What am I going to do? Who am I going to become? Because Jesus is meeting me right here. Jesus is right here. Three days. He's blinded. Not eating or drinking anything. For a lot of people, I think there's been three months. <laughs> three months to really evaluate the direction of my life, the direction of our life. You know, am I headed in the right direction? Or has this been a respite, a time out, and God's saying, hold on, look at your life, look at the direction, look at the purpose. Three days. Well, in Damascus, verse 10, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. So God uses his name. Yes, Lord, he answered. And the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Now I want you to look at that just for a minute. For he is praying. That's kind of unique because Saul was a religious leader. Of course he's praying. That's what he grew up doing. He always prayed. And for the Jews, they have many memorized prayers. Many prayers that they learn, even as kids, they memorize these prayers. Maybe you grew up in a church and you, you memorized prayers. And you kind of use these, these memor, memorization prayers, right? For the Jews, it would be like the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. I mean, incredible prayer, great prayer, the Shema. But after a while, what happens many times with memorized prayers is they become rote right? Your heart's not in it. You're, you're saying it. You know, if you're a parent, right, you, we teach our kids to pray prayers, and we want them to memorize those. Maybe you taught your kids at night, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And we said that prayer, and your kids, they, they pray that prayer at night, and that was great. We're teaching them that that's a discipline. Or right before dinner, right, Rub-a-dub-dub, thank God for the grub, you know? It's like, you know, you, you got to learn that, you know? <laughs> we got to thank God for this, right? What we're teaching them is it's important to pray before bed. It's important to pray before a meal. But if you're a parent or a grandparent here, isn't it awesome when one day you start to hear your kids pray from their heart? Isn't it awesome when one time you come in at night and they go, hey, can we pray for Grandma? I know she's having a hard time. Can we pray for her? God, be with Grandma. And you just hear that? I mean, you just start to cry. You're like, oh, my goodness. They're getting it. It's not just a rote prayer. It's not just a memorization. It's their heart. That's what was happening right here with Saul. And God saw it. Jesus goes, go there because he's 
praying. <laughs> he's pouring his heart out. He's being authentic. He's being real. He's being genuine. Go there, Ananias. <laughs> and in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. But look at verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias is like, uh, Jesus, I don't know if you know this. This is a bad dude, okay, man? This guy was like wreaking havoc on the church in Jerusalem and he's come here with an army. He's coming here to arrest people. You sure this isn't a trap, right? Like, I'm going to go there. And I'm gonna, I, I, you're sure about this, right, God? You, you got this one down. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, exclamation point. Go, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, you know, like, Brother Saul, we're on the same team, right? Brother, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, oh, I love that. If you underline, underline that. Immediately, right? Here comes God busting in. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Man, he's a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. We're going to go through verse 22. Look at this. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Man, he jumped in. He's like, guys, I got to learn. I want to be a part of it. I could see him being in a men's group. I could see him being in a community group. I want to learn. I want to grow. I got to learn more here. At once, underline that, verse 20, at once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All right, remember the synagogues, those were places where the Jews would go to worship on Shabbat, on Saturday. It was kind of their church place, right? There's still synagogues all over the world today in different cities. And so here comes Saul into the synagogue, and they're like, whoa, here's that renowned teacher. Here's that famous Pharisee. And he comes in, and he starts talking about Jesus. He's telling them about Jesus, <laughs> And all those heard him were astonished, and they asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, how awesome is that? I mean, the guy you think would never become a Christ follower. The guy you think is so far away from God. And Jesus changes his life, changes his heart. And the process impacts the world. There was a guy who lived about 100 years ago named Frank Morrison. He was born in England, raised in all the best schools. He was a lawyer. He was successful. As he got older, he made a lot of money. But he had this thing against Christians. He was an atheist himself. And so he set out to disprove Christianity. He said, I'm going to show you that Christianity isn't true. And, and he set out, he started studying everything he could, reading everything he could, interviewing all these different people. And he came down to the two kind of major events. He said, one, it was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If I can disprove this, I can disprove Christianity. Two, it was the conversion of Saul. He said, here's a guy who has all this money, success, power. He's a lawyer, right? You know, what's going to change him? What's going to transform him to, to change his entire life, to give all of that up, to take everything and follow Jesus? And so he's trying to disprove both of these. And you know what happened? In the process, Jesus met him and transformed his life. And Frank Morrison gave his life to Christ, became a follower of Jesus. He went on to write a book in 1930 called Who Moved the Stone? Who moved the stone? Because you see, he realized that when there was a Jesus placed in the tomb, there was a huge stone that was put in front of the tomb, and there was the Roman seal put on the stone that says, if you move this stone, you will die. And there are Roman soldiers around. What happened? Who moved the stone? It could only be God. 
He only read God, and God changed his life. And that book, written in 1930, was reprinted, 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 and led to so many people coming to know Christ. It was last reprinted in 2006. Almost 100 years of God changing people's lives because of Frank Morrison. See, what God's going to do in Saul's life is going to impact so many others. And when God moves in your life, and when you and I begin to live our purpose, it doesn't just impact us. It impacts all the people around us for the glory of God. All right, if you're taking notes today, here's some things that I want you to write down. There's some fundamental truths, some fundamental truths that are in this passage today. Look at this. Number one, Jesus is passionate about his church. I got to tell you, you see that right here, how passionate he is about his church. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus, but the church. I think Saul's going, whoa, 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 there's a little misunderstanding here, you know? I'm going after the church. I'm going after these, these Christ followers. Hold on, what, what are you doing? <laughs> However, Jesus closely identifies with the church. When Jesus steps in, protecting his church, protecting his people. Jesus loves his church. You know, the church is Jesus' idea, right? I mean, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I mean, it's all Jesus' idea. The church is important to him. The church is called the bride and the body of Jesus. I love that. Uh, guys, there's people out there who would say, you know what, well, uh, you know what, I really like Jesus, but I don't know about the church. And you're like, what? That's like saying, I like you, but I don't like your body. You know, it kind of goes hand in hand. I mean, I don't really know how to say it. I mean, like, it's who I am, right? I mean, I, we're just together. It's, it's a part of it. There's people who go, well, I'm just spiritual, you know, and I don't really need the church, and the church isn't perfect. Right? The church isn't perfect. My body's not perfect. No, 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 no. But listen, Jesus is. And we're called to be a part of the church. It's so important to be a part of a church. So important. And I'm so glad you're here today. Guys, it's just such an encouragement to me. I'm so glad you're watching online. You're a part of Rolling Hills. But listen, if you move at some point, you know, I want you to be a part of this church for, for the rest of your life. I hope and pray we can just lock arms and do ministry and impact the gospel all over the world. But maybe one day if you move somewhere else, find a church. Be a part of a church. We need the body of Christ. We need each other. You know, saying like I'm a Christ follower, but I'm not a part of a church, that's like saying I'm a football player, but I, I'm not on a football team. I don't really need them. You know, it's just me. You know, you do it. Good luck, man. I'm a soldier, but I'm not really in the army. You know, hey, great. You know, good luck. With the, yeah, you know, we need the church. And you see that fundamental truth right here. Jesus stepping in and going, listen, I just want you to know this. I identify with my church. It's my body. It's my bride. All right, look at this, number two. Salvation is the desire of God for every person. Salvation is the desire of God for every person. I am Jesus, meeting him right there, who you're persecuting. He replied, now get up and go to the city and you'll be told what you must do. Hey, Jesus meets every person. Jesus met this guy who you think, hey, there's no way. I mean, he is mean. He is breathing out murderous threats. He is so far from God, Jesus meets him. And Jesus meets every one of us. And every one of us, Jesus knows your name and he loves you. And he is drawing you to the heart of the Father. You are that precious to him. Hey, there is progressive salvation or instantaneous salvation. For some of you, you know, you don't remember a time you didn't know Jesus. You just gotta grew up in the church. Right, you were in the church nine months before you were born. You know, your parents were like, they were there, right? I grew up, I was at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday nights. But there was a time when I was eight years old. <laughs> eight years old that God just got a hold of me and I got down on my knees. I said, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the Lord of my life. There's other people, man, it's just instantaneous. It's like Saul. I mean, maybe that's your story. You just remember, I just woke up in a ditch and I just needed, I got on my knees and I just said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I need you. Or maybe you were out and you're just connecting with God in creation. You're out on a mountain or you were, you know, somewhere at the beach and, and God just got a hold of your life and transformed your life. A lot of times we think, well, you know, I don't have one of those dramatic stories. That's okay. I think Saul would say, hey, thank God you don't. Thank God that your parents took you to church. Thank God that you had this incredible opportunity to know Jesus a lot longer. 
But however it is, Jesus wants to meet you. And there is a joy in salvation that only God, only God can change a heart. Only God can change a life. Hey, each person must make a decision about Jesus. Every one of us. You got to make a decision. What do you believe? Who is Jesus? Is he truly the son of God? Has he come to redeem and restore me? It's not about me. What do you believe about Jesus? A.W. Tozer says, what you believe about Jesus is the most important thing about you. What you believe about Jesus is the most important thing about you. And it's so true, right? I mean, is he enough for me? Can he handle my salvation? Can he handle eternal life? Can he handle all my problems? Can he handle all my challenges? Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All right, look at this. Our response to God's invitation. Our response to God's invitation. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. All right, I love amazing grace. I was blind, but now I see. I mean, this is literally for him. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength, accepting Christ or rejecting him. Every one of us, most important decision of our life, because what we do with Jesus impacts everything else. Impacts, you know, who we date, who we marry, impacts, right, our career, impacts what we do financially, it impacts everything in our lives. Are we going to accept Christ or reject him? Baptism follows salvation. Guys, that is a fundamental truth that you see right here. Paul, right, Saul, he immediately gets up and is like, I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. Some of you, you you were baptized as an infant. If you were baptized as an infant, great, praise God. That's awesome. But you realize that was your parents' decision, right? I mean, that was your parents are the ones who did that. Thank God for godly parents. That's awesome. But at some point in your spiritual journey, baptism follows salvation. You make that commitment. I want to be baptized. I want to take a stand. I want to say, I'm putting a stake in the ground. And Saul immediately gets up and says, I want to be baptized. You're dying your old way of life. You're going under the water. You're raised to walk a new life. I mean, Saul's 28, 29, 30 years old. Jesus was 30 years old when he was baptized. But it's like not the end, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of this incredible journey with God. And then share God's grace in your life. He just began to talk about it. He began, I, I gotta tell you, Jesus is the Messiah. I gotta tell you what God's done for me. My life was headed this direction. It was a train wreck. But man, look what God has done. And I just wanna share that with you. Hey, when you meet Jesus, your purpose changes. Your purpose changes. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> Saul's purpose became to share Jesus. Right? His purpose before, making money, success, putting out the church, anger, bitterness. <laughs> but now it's Jesus. Love, grace, hope, peace, joy. His purpose changed. Ananias was bold for Jesus. You see, Ananias kind of gets overlooked in this story a little bit because, I mean, this is Saul. This is a big deal. It's a great. But Ananias, you got to say, he was bold, right? I mean, he, he was stepped into it. And I want to tell you, as a Christ follower, there's going to be times that God's going to prompt your heart. And maybe you're wrestling with it right now. There's times when God's just saying, hey, I want you to go have a spiritual conversation. And maybe with, it's with your own teenager, you know, who's not making good decisions. And you're like, ah, I don't want to push him away. But, you know, or maybe it's somebody in your family who doesn't know Christ. Or, or maybe it's a coworker, and, and God's just calling you, hey, step in. And a lot of times we're like, ah, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to say the wrong thing. And, and, but man, Ananias, he, he said, look, I'm scared. I'm, I'm nervous, God. But then he was bold and he did it. And the impact of that godly man on Saul's life, the impact on Christendom, because he was bold enough to step into it. We get to a point to say, not my will, but God's will be done. Have you gotten to that point in your life, right? Not my will, not my agenda, not my purpose, not my thing. No, no, God, I wanna live for you. Because God, your plans are so much better. They're so much bigger than I could dream or imagine. God, I wanna live my life for you. My purpose, right? My life's purpose is to know Jesus and to make him known. Know Jesus, make him known. Every day if I wake up, Jesus, I wanna know you. I wanna know you more. I wanna make you known. For all of us, I wanna know God. I wanna make him known. 
That's the life purpose. You know, Saul, right? We're going to see over the next couple of weeks, he becomes the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul who takes the gospel to all over the Roman Empire, and we're still feeling the impact today. Takes the gospel to Gentiles. Praise God, because most of us in here are Gentiles, right? Praise God for transforming his life. But praise God for transforming our lives. I pray you never lose the joy of your salvation. And whether you were eight years old or whether you were 12 or 15 or, or whatever, maybe it's even today. But the fact that the God of the universe would send his one and only son for you, the God of the universe would send Jesus to die on a cross so that you could be saved, you could be transformed, you could have eternal life. The God redeems and restores you. Praise be to God and the joy of knowing Jesus. Paul will write later on in his life. He says, hey, I count everything before as a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Oh, wow. That's what God wants to do for you. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. And for us to have a time to respond back to God today, and maybe right where you are, you just want to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting me. Maybe it was in a church service. Maybe it was at home. Maybe it was with your parents, or maybe it was with a pastor, or maybe it was at Starbucks with a friend. Or maybe it's right here today. That Jesus meets you. He knows your name. And he says, I love you. And I'm going to give my life so that you can have eternity with God. Maybe today you just want to say, Jesus, forgive my sins, redeem me, restore me. I commit my life to you. Maybe for you, you just want to say, I want that joy, the joy of my salvation. I want that peace, that hope. Oh, maybe today God's speaking to you. Maybe it's baptism. Saying it's time. You take that step. Be bold. Or maybe there's somebody God's put on your heart. And God's calling you to have a spiritual conversation. And he's already bringing them to mind right now. And God's saying, I'm going to be with you. And I want you to go and just share my love with them. Share the joy, the hope, the peace. Let them know that I'm their living hope. So Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your church, the body of Christ. Thank you, Father, for family, friends, for health. But thank you most of all for Jesus, your son who saved us, redeemed us, restored us, made us whole, made us new. Thank you for transforming Saul's life and thank you for transforming our life. Father God, we need you today. Oh, now more than ever, God, everything happening in our world, we need you, our living hope. So fill us with joy, with peace, with purpose. Let us know you and make you known as your disciples today. And it's in the beautiful, precious, holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen, amen, amen.